Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens weekly webinar, Let's Talk Gardens. Before we begin, just a note that this webinar is being recorded for future use and closed captioning is available. To enable the live captions, click on the CC button below at the bottom of your Zoom menu. Hi, my name is Sarah Hedin and I'm the Living Collections Manager for Smithsonian Gardens. I'll be hosting today's session along with my co-host, Sarah Tebow, who is a lead horticulturist for Smithsonian Gardens. Joining us today to present the program Made in the Shade, creating a dynamic layered shade garden is Sylvia Smeisel, Smithsonian Gardens lead horticulturist at the Natural, National Museum of Natural History. Before we get started, please note that, that, that your microphones are muted and that your cameras are turned off. Please also add any questions or comments you have to the chat box. Sarah and I will facilitate these at the end of the presentation. I will now hand things over to Sylvia. Welcome, Sylvia. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Let's Talk Gardens. Um, so I'm going to do a little housekeeping share screen. Bear with me. Uh, share. Share. Aha, there's a reason I work with plants and not technology regularly. All right presentation mode. All right, so um, before we get into the specifics, I want to welcome everyone. Um, and I want to find out where everyone's joining us from. So Sarah T. Uh, T. Bowl is going to pop up a poll asking where everyone is from. And you can uh, answer that in the uh, chat. So I'll give you a few minutes. I love all the answers that pop up. <laughs> a, 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 B, Northeast, Southeast. That's great, Sylvia. Yeah. <laughs> That's great presentation. Thank you. All right. So it looks like um, the majority of our, our listeners are coming from the Mid-Atlantic area, which is pretty common for our talks here. But we have, looks like people from all over the country, which is great. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today um, is not just specific to the Mid-Atlantic or any particular region. Um, it's more about how to read your space, take stock of what you have, um, different elements of design, some different plant palettes that work well. Um, in a lot of uh, mid-Atlantic and southeast, maybe a little bit northeast. Um, and I've got a lot of great information that's going to be added as the resource page. So don't, don't panic. You don't have to frantically take notes. Um, we have a lot of these things written down for you, including uh, a very extensive plant list, because I know that's what everybody's excited about. I want the plant list. I want the plant list. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the layered design aspect of shade gardening um, and things like that. So uh, next I want to, do we want to do the second poll, Sarah? Or should we go ahead and get started? We'll, we'll wait, we'll hold off, we'll hold off. Advance, next. All right, so I'm gonna move this so you guys can see it. So why is shade important? Well, um, one of the reasons that people come to us and ask about shade is because many people have been gardening for years and years. And um, they said, I bought my house 20 years ago and my yard's full sun. Well, 20 years ago, maybe you planted that tree. Uh, and now instead of having a full sun yard, you have shade under it. So gardens are not static. They're always changing. Plants grow. Um, and we have to continually read our space, learn a little bit more about it, and adapt and tweak. Um, also, it's important that we have shade for wildlife. So a lot of um, wildlife needs both sun and shade to recuperate in the heat, just like we do as, as people, um, as in addition to uh, different habitats and water sources and things like that. And also, we want it. I mean, it's 100 degrees outside in the middle of summer. Do you want to be in the shade too? It's great. Let me tell you, whenever I had interns, um, I would have them weed in the middle of the summer 
and I can tell you the shady areas had no weeds in them because they would always go there first. So that's just a good indication of how, of how much we as, as humans really enjoy shade and utilize those spaces. And of course, uh, if you look at shade as an opportunity rather than a challenge, you can find more plants that work well and you can have even more plants, which is as gardeners what we really want to do anyway, right? So here's a picture of my puppy dog enjoying the shade after a walk because he got a little too hot and he wanted to cool off. So that's just goes to show you we all want it and so let's just embrace it. Next, I want to talk about getting to know your site. So a lot of people uh, may have been gardening for a while. They might be new. Um, Sarah Tebow, can you pop up that next poll for us while I'm going over this slide, please? Um, so there's different things to look at in your site. Um, where, are the, where is the sun hitting? What angle is it? What time is it? What's the intensity? Um, what's your soil like? What's the size of your space, both length, width, and height? A lot, a lot of times we forget how much height we have, um, which is great. And how do you want to use your space? Is it something that you want to be outside in all the time? Do you have kids or grandkids, pets that want to use the space? Um, do you entertain a lot? Do you want to have a nice arbor? Um, all right, so I'm just looking at, look at our chat screen here. So it looks like a wide variety. Yeah, so it, and this talk is, is uh, when I made it, it was meant to be very accessible to a wide range of audiences. So if you're brand new to gardening, that's fine. Hopefully you'll pick up some spot, some techniques and, and tips that we use. Um, if you've been gardening a while and now you have more shade and you're not quite sure what to do, if you want to learn how to look at plants differently and more of a design aspect, we have that as, as well included in here. So I'm excited to share with you some topics that we've we've gone over here. All right, uh, next we want to talk about the different kinds of shade. So shade is not all created equally. It's not black or white, shady or sunny. There are a broad range of sunny conditions. So when we talk about shade, we're typically referring to four to six, four hours of shade, four to six or less. Uh, full sun. So let me let me say that again so it's not so confusing. Full sun is considered six or more hours of sunlight a day. So you might see a tree an area underneath it and it's pretty sunny part of the day and then shady for a little bit and then maybe sunny later. What you think is full it might be shade is actually mostly full shade full sun with a little bit of shade in it. And so I encourage all of you all to go out in your space, whether it's your community plot, your backyard, and go out several times throughout the day and notice where the shadows are, notice how intense they are, and then be mindful of where you are um, elevation wise, part of the country, time of year, and that type of thing. So again, full sun, six or more hours of direct sunlight. Part, sh part shade to part sun uh, is four to six hours of direct sunlight, full shade, less than four hours. Um, so you can see the picture on the left, that's very much full shade. Um, it's in the shade all day long, except for when the leaves drop on those trees, creating um, seasonal shade in the warmer months and more full sun in the colder winter months. On the picture on the right, this is a picture I took out when I was in California, Southern California. Although you, you're seeing shade, they have a very direct sun, intense sun. Um, and so they're, they have to adapt to that. And I, they've done that quite well and um, put in a water fountain, a little water, water feature. Okay, um, so here's an example of a space. I was walking around downtown and I saw this nice area. This is at the US Botanic Garden. Um, I want you to look at this space. This is, um, I believe, mid-morning when I went out. And just look at the different areas. Are you seeing areas that are full sun? Maybe some shadows that indicate 
um, part sun, part shade. Uh, and if you go here in the back, you can see my arrow here in the back here, that's going to be pretty full, full shade. You can see they put some nice places to sit and that's where people are going to want to rest. Later on in the day, farther in this turf area, that's going to be full sun. So really, while this might look pretty shady, it's mostly sun because of the shadows that are cast and the time of the day. All right. Here's another example. This is on the National Mall. This is to showcase the difference of um, the way shade shifts. So on the left, this is 10 o'clock in the morning. This is just a generic sad looking elm tree. <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, what type of deciduous tree in this example. And um, you can see it's got a lot of full sun. It's pretty direct. By three o'clock, um, you can see that it's, it's got quite a bit of dappled shade. So you can think, well, if I were to plant something underneath it, I would probably do something that's good for part shade. So that could take some sun, but does it need full sun all the time? Of course, I wouldn't plant anything there because it's going to get trampled, but that's another talk for another time. All right, here's another spot. Um, this is outside of the Museum of Natural History. Uh, this is on a sidewalk. So you can see some different shadows from trees. This is actually mostly sun, but it does get some intense shade a couple times, a couple pockets throughout the day. So you can see things like salvia um, on the bottom there. That'll take quite a bit of full sun. There's some Amsonia, a lot of full sun plants that can also tolerate part shade. Um, the hookera, if it's this particular hookera or coral bells, because we have irrigation, um, it can adapt to mostly full conditions, knowing that this tree is going to grow bigger and bigger and cast more shade each year. So that's something to be mindful of as well. All right, now here's an example of um, walking in the woods. I went out, went for a little hike last weekend and you can see that this is a lot of deep shade and dapple shade. And this is an example of what I consider seasonal shade. So when I say seasonal shade, uh, you have deciduous trees and evergreen trees. So deciduous, if we remember from our science classes means that they lose their leaves in the winter, which means there's a lot of direct sun in the winter, late fall to early spring winter months. And that allows for things like these may apples on the picture on the right, which are some of our spring ephemerals, which we're very lucky to have a lot of in this part of the country. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And there's several listed on the, on the plant list that's going to be um, shared with you all in the link in the chat that I believe uh, Sarah is going to add for us. All right, let's talk a little bit about sun intensity. So a couple things that I've noticed that um, sometimes when we're outside all the time, we think, oh, I know what I'm doing. And you just sort of go into your normal day-to-day -day routine and you don't think about some of these nuances. And so I reminded myself and, and added them to this um, slide that sun intensity changes depending on your location. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. It's getting on my nerves. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, back, back, back. Sorry. So sun intensity. So sun can be more intense later in the day and in the afternoon. So morning sun and late evening sun tends to be less intense than midday and afternoon. Also think about the latitude where you are as far as how close you are to the equator. Um, we're all, we're all in the Northern Hemisphere. So the farther north you go, the higher the latitude, typically the less intense. Um, if you consider something like um, Northern Michigan and Louisiana, they're gonna have different sun intensity levels. Same thing with altitude. If you're gardening um, on the top of the mountain, you're gonna have more intense sun than if you're lower down in the valley. Now, these are generalizations. There's lots of microclimates, but again, I'm encouraging you all go out in your, in your space that you're gardening in, 
learn to read the sun intensities and the shadows, maybe even make a little sun chart uh, for yourself so that you can uh, remind, remind yourself in the winter when everything looks different than in the summer. And most of us will have a mixture of sun exposures. That's the most typical. Um, it's not always one or the other. All right, so here I just have a couple of, of pictures to, to showcase what you can do with um, different sun intensities. The, the picture on the far left is pretty much full shade year round, maybe some part shade in the center. Um, that's a picture of our beloved blood root, which is a spring ephemeral, meaning it comes up in the spring, it blooms, and then the leaves wither and it goes dormant through the warmer, warmest parts of the year. Um, and that's an example, another example of seasonal shade. So it's under a lot of deciduous trees. On the right, um, this is another picture from California. Again, while you see the benches in shade uh, that's created from the arbor that has, I believe, grapevine, it's very intense um, sun and it's very hot and dry there otherwise. So the area closest to the bench, you might have some parts, part shade, part sun, um, but for the most part, it's going to be pretty intense full sun. Okay, uh, just want to check in. Do we have any more questions? I know I'm going through a lot of um, information. Just checking the chat box. I think we're good. Okay. All right, so next I want to talk a little bit about soil and drainage. So soil can be a, a topic unto itself. Um, I think I took two classes in college about soil. So we're just going to do some very basics, um, things to be mindful of. Uh, one thing that I encourage all of my listeners to do is to, is to con conduct a soil test. And this can be done through your local county extension. Um, depending on where you are, anywhere in the country, you can contact your county extension, send in a soil sample, typically for a nominal fee. And they will, a couple weeks later, send you a report of what the contents of your soil is. And the most important part, I think, is it will give you an idea of how much sand, silt, and clay you have. And those are the three primary components um, of particle sizes in your soil. Sand being the coarsest, and it's going to drain water the most quickly. Clay has the smallest particles, and it is going to retain water. So knowing what you have, especially if you're new to gardening, um, can indicate a lot of things for you. Because if you have clay and you're trying to, or you have sand and you're trying to grow something that requires a lot of water, that's gonna be a little tricky. So good to know with what you have to start with. Another thing um, to be mindful of is the drainage. And so when we're talking shade, typically shady spots dry, much more slowly than sunny spots. So if you're if watering, oh, in the sun, I water three times a week. Well, you may not need to do it as much in shady locations. So just being mindful of that. Um, if your soil is wet, if you take that shovel, dig in the ground, and you're like, wow, I haven't watered in here at all. It hasn't rained in the past couple of days, but it seems really wet. You might have a lot of clay content in your soil. You might also have some compaction, especially if there's been a lot of foot traffic. Um, if you drive over a certain part of your, your lot or you've had some new construction, um, that can be an indication of poor um, drainage if you have compaction. Um, also, if you smell anything that just smells really bad, like standing water and rotten, you might have anaerobic soil, which is also a component of um, compaction. So if that's an issue, you might need to get in there and dig it up, add some coarse grit um, according to your um, soil test, what, what they recommend on that. Um, ideally, you have average moisture in your soil, which means that you have a balance of sand, silt, and clay. Um, so it's going to hold some moisture, but it's also going to percolate and drain regularly. So you're not going to have a lot of standing water. Um, that is the uh, easiest type to work with, um, but it's not, that's not to say that other conditions can't be overcome. 
And then lastly, we have dry soil. Um, and most likely, if you have dry soil, you either have a lot of sand. So uh, in the mid-Atlantic, if you're closer to the water and have a high uh, sand content in your soil, it's going to drain more quickly. Um, if you're near building foundations or um, below underhangs, so a lot of people think, oh, it's in sun and it should be fine, but they forget about the overhang on their roof that blocks some of that rainwater. Um, and a lot of times underneath trees, there's a lot of root competition. So those trees, they want that water too. So there's some competition um, for rainwater and irrigation. So it's a couple things to be mindful of when you're walking around. All right, um, when I think about gardening, I think about these are man-made structures or human-made structures. And so this is not um, what's necessarily naturally occurring, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn a lot from mother nature um, because she teaches us some great lessons that we can translate into our gardening lives. So um, a couple of things that I've learned from Mother Nature is that shady conditions occur in woodland clearings and along edges. And so that means if you see um, a, woody, a woody space, you're in the woods, if there's a clearing, you'll, you'll notice that the plants that grow along that clearing will take some sun and some shade, but they're a little bit more sheltered. And so it's, it's interesting to notice how the plant life changes um, at these different opportunities. Also that plant height is staggered and layered. So you wouldn't have tall trees, short plants, and then nothing in between. It tends to be like a nice staggered blend. Um, that's because plants will grow wherever there is a location. And if they get enough sunlight and water that they need, um, they'll thrive and it'll be a nice mixture and a nice composition. Also, Living things aren't static. I think a lot of times people who maybe who are new to gardening, they think, okay, it's spring. I want to go out. I want to put my plants out and I want them to stay this size and stay in this line. And that's it. That's all I have to do. Well, plants grow. And I think we all get excited and we forget that. Um, so when we're planting, we're, we need to remember, okay, this is going to get 10 feet tall or this is going to get five feet feet tall. This is going to, tree is going to get bigger and create more shade. Maybe a tree fell down and you don't have full shade, you have sun. And so it's good to, to learn your space, read it, and be willing to adapt and, and play in your garden and, and really make some interesting combinations based on what you have. Also, there's no hard and fast rules. Whatever guidelines we put together, whatever book you read, they're exactly that. They're guidelines. They can change from one day to the next. I think we experiment all the time thinking this probably won't work well here. And half the time it does and half the time it doesn't. And that's how we become better gardeners because we try a lot of different things. We find out what doesn't work and then we find out what does work. And finally, plants thrive in well-suited conditions. So this goes back to that age old adage, pick the right plant for the right space. So know your space so you can pick the right plant. Okay, how are we doing in our, in our chat? All right, great. All right, next I wanna to shift to the garden composition and design. So we've talked about how to read your space, different kinds of shade, your soils, that type of thing reading mother nature, being aware of the compositions in nature. So now let's look at the design approach on how we pick out plants and combinations so that they really become dynamic, exciting spaces that we wanna spend a lot of time in. Um, successful shade garden designs tend to prioritize shape, form and texture before colorful blooms. And so a lot of times shade gardening can be more subtle um, but it also draws you in and can be very interesting textural and shape contrast. All right, so first I wanna talk about shape. 
that can be either the shape of the overall plant itself, that can be the shape of the flower structure, it can be the shape of the leaf, a lot of different things. And the way that the shapes are used in a space help draw the eye to a focal point or several focal points. So I want you to look at this spot on the right. Just look at it for a few seconds. What is your eye drawn to? Is it landing in one spot? Is it moving throughout the space? Is it following a certain color? Are you intrigued by a certain shape or texture that it draws you in? So when I look at this image, I see these lovely three trees. So you have this repeating pattern. These are crepe myrtles. This is outside the Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian here. So you have these lovely structures in the back that create the backbone and the repeating pattern. Um, I noticed this really coarse textured hellebore in the foreground. Um, I notice this yellow um, erysimum or wallflower that contrasts well against this dark purple um, in the heuchera. And the heuchera, that dark purple, moves throughout the space. So while my eye might start here, it flows through the space and there's lots of interesting things to look at. So in this image, those repeating shapes of those trees form continuity. The contrasting shapes create more dynamic, engaging um, composition that makes the eye want to linger. All right, so in this, this position or this picture, I'm sorry, everything in this image is green or different shades of green, but it has lots of different shapes and textures. So I want to show you what I mean by that. So the first shape I see is this on the left in the picture, you see this big tall tree, big triangular shape, right? Next, you see sort of a dark, darker green, sort of rectangular shape underneath. And then you see this lovely bronze um, triangle on the left. And then you see these two hosses that have opposite shapes. One is very base shaped and one is very low. So although there are no colors, be, there's no flowers in this, it's all texture and shape. I think it's a beautiful composition. I wanted to stop and look more closely and inspect the textures that are in here, look at the different shapes and look more deeply to see what else this space had in store. Again, um, textures can do, we, we've got a great, um, opportunity to really play with textures in shade because there are often many plants that do well in shade that aren't as um, prolific in flowering as some of our, our sunny plants are. So on the left, you see some, I think these are anem anemones. Uh, I believe they're a type of anemone and some ferns. So nice bold shaped leaf next to a very fine lacy fern. Again, no flowers, um, but still a very interesting texture. On um, this second picture in the middle here, um, so I'm blanking on what's in here, a fatsia and um, mm, 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 it'll come to me in a minute, uh, but this is in our hopped garden, beautiful winter composition. Um, and although they are flowering and they are interesting, um, these two would pair well, Pyrrhus, that's the other one. Um, the pyrus and the fascia. Um, the two textures really work well together, whether they're flowering or not. So rough textures hold the eye, make the viewer feel as though they're closer to the plant. Fine, fine textured uh, plants tend to recede in, and blend into the landscape and having contrasting textures um, create some really interesting things. All right. Next, I want to talk a little bit about color. So while I said um, that a lot of shade gardens focus on texture and form 
and um, their leaf their leaf texture or leaf color and not necessarily the bloom. Color is still very important um, in a, a good garden design and people see co color differently. Um, and that's, there's not really a right or wrong, but there are some certain guidelines, rules of thumb that we talk about um, using color. So the three main combinations are the harmonious, complementary, and your triangle or triad. So harmonious, um, it just means that they're neighbors on the color wheel. So that would be, if you can see here, like the red, red, orange, yellow. So these are harmonious colors. It could also be blue, green, and lime. So any two or three that are neighbors on the color wheel. Complementary just means that they're opposite. Um, so you might have purple and yellow, you might have blue and orange, you might have red and green. You might also think about um, a triangle effect, which is a really nice com a combination of things. So like a blue with a red, with a yellow. Or you could do an orange, a light blue, and a lime. So it's really anywhere on the color wheel and it can be shifted. We all have colors that we like together and that we don't like together and certain colors that we gravitate towards. Um, and that's all perfectly fine because it's your garden and it's there to make you happy and you do what makes you happy, right? That's why we garden. A couple things to note about um, color in the shade is that dark colors appear darker and recede. So if you have something that's um, a dark blue or foliage that's very dark green, it's going to fade into the background unless you have something brighter nearby to make it contrast and pop. Um, that being said, bright colors also look brighter in the shade. So your yellows, your limes, your oranges um, are gonna look nice and bright and pop. And also the use of white, white flowers are great in dark shady locations. A lot of people think, oh, white, that's really boring. But if you pair something white flowered with maybe some, something that has foliage that's silver, that silver hairy foliage is gonna reflect light and it's gonna really brighten up that space. Okay, so again, here's another exercise from this picture. So what are your eye, what's your eye drawn to? Just take a couple sec seconds and look at it. So I see um, one of my favorite combinations in dark spaces is lime and burgundy. I, I think those are really great combinations together. So the first thing that my eye is drawn to is that lime green Hackanacloa or forest grass. Um, it's lovely shade tolerant. Um, one of my favorite uh, applications of it is on the hillside and you just have a big mass of it. It looks like, like water or rain falling down, it creates a lot of nice movement um, as well as uh, a lovely sound when the wind blows. Um, you can see here, a lot of this dark foliage in the background, this dark blue green foliage, this dark burgundy, it's there, but you're not really, your eye isn't really drawn to it. Um, also this pink, you know, I think it's a geranium we have here on the left. That pink, it, it's quite a bright, bright color in this dark space. So it pops a lot more. Um, I'm also noticing sort of these nice gray tree trunks that are moving throughout the space. So again, there's what, one thing flowering right now? This is just texture, just color. Um, you can definitely add more things in to create harmony and draw the eye through the space. Okay, how about this one? So to me, the first thing I see is this lime green Hookra corabels. And I, I laugh because I think um, 
one of the horticulturists over there, uh, this is at the uh, Air and Space Museum, really loves the lime green in the, in the shade and another one really doesn't care for it. Um, so again, it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just also um, personal preference and how you perceive color and the contrast. So um, we've got some lovely lime green that moves through that space, draws your eye, whole, sort of pulls that whole garden bed in together. You have those foundation um, plantings of the willow oaks. Um, I believe there's some camellias in there, macuba, azaleas. You know, you'll see the azaleas are blooming, the pink, the white. And while they're a little bit of color, it's mostly these just different textures and shapes that you notice. Okay, here's just a couple more photos of um, the shade using how color pops in shade and darker colors recede. On the far left, um, you have an autumn fern that gets beautiful um, lime green to bronze foliage um, over top of some crocus. So this is, I think this is like February or March um, when this photo was taken. Center image is full shade. We've got, uh, I believe, New Guinea and Patience, some begonia, asparagus fern, and it literally to me looks like they grew these plants together in a hanging basket and then put them down on the ground once they filled in and it works really well. So that's maybe a quick tip. Um, if you don't know what to do, get a shade hanging basket from your garden center and um, take it out of the pot and plant that in the ground, done. You don't have a lot of time. Um, on the far right, uh, apologies, this is not a great picture, but the contrast between the um, lime green margins of this dogwood and the dark purple silver um, in this fern um, work really well together. Again, full shade, nothing's flowering. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about layering and what I mean by that. Um, so if you remember earlier in the talk, we discussed how in nature, plants come, uh, plant communities grow at different heights and, and they're staggered. So it's not straight lines, but up and down and different shapes and forms. And that creates a more pleasing, enjoyable, dynamic shade garden. So um, I've broken these down into three or four basic groups, just so it's a little bit easier to understand the layering process. And in my handout that's attached, I have my plant list divided out in these four sections. So your top layer, your middle layer, your lower layer, and what I call season extenders. So your top layer could either be full sun if you're starting with a blank space, or it can be part shade because you've already got existing trees. So that's flexible in its um, description. But basically these are your their tallest structures um, that you're going to start your planting with. Uh, it's going to be your shrubs, your trees. Maybe you want to create a shade structure because you can't wait for there to be shade sooner. It's so hot in your backyard and you just want to sit outside. So maybe it includes um, a pergola or an arbor, um, but that's also going to um, give you your structure and your form. The middle layer, I feel like that is the um, more intense uh, creative space just because there's such a wide variety to choose from. So this can be anything from small trees, shrubs, perennials, um, all the way down to you know just a few inches. And that's where you can get a lot of your, your flowers that are gonna be at eye level just because of the height. Um, and it's uh, often where the plants are in scale to people humans and people. So a lot of fun things to, to play with in that middle layer. Lower layer can also be very interesting and draw you in. These are your ground covers, your low growing perennials, um, maybe different uh, interesting rocks or containers, shapes, colors. Um, and then finally your season extenders. And this one is totally optional. Some people love working with tropicals and bulbs and things that are not hardy in their region. And that's 
totally acceptable. It's a great way to um, utilize your house plants, especially. So they've been in our house all winter and now we're like, okay, I can't get through the kitchen because there's so many, you know, things trying to stay in there. Like I gotta get them out of my house. Well, often a great uh, option is to slide them into shady locations, especially while they're transitioning from being the inside to outside in the full sun. So um, I do that a lot. I, my husband can't wait for it to be spring. So I move all the house plants out and he actually has room in the house. All right, and these are just some nice photos I found um, that just that illustrate, I think, the, the layered effect, the different shapes and textures. Um, I think this is up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and see the un, on the left, there's an understory combination um, in this deciduous forest of azaleas and wildflowers, um, probably some calmia in there as well, a mountain laurel. Um, on the right, looks like you've got some viburnum, um, camellias, rhododendrons, magnolias, you know, different textures and shapes, but it, it makes a really pleasant um, combination. Again, this is just another example of um, understory in a shady location. You can see some ferns down here for some nice texture low growing arching shapes of these understory trees. Um, some examples of understory trees are your red buds, your um, dogwoods, uh, things like that that can take a fair amount of sun but also a fair amount of shade that are really adaptable. Okay, and now the best part, let's talk a little bit more about plants. All right, so I have to put this little bit in here. I know it's not everyone's favorite topic, but um, having spent days and days um, removing invasive plants from woodlands and the amount of work and, and effort it takes to do this, um, there are definitely some plants that you want to avoid. And while they're very common and they're readily available and they're inexpensive, um, they do inflict a lot of damage to our native ecosystems and outcompete our, um, our local plant and animal community. And so I encourage everyone to check your uh, region. Um, one website that I find useful is invasives.org. Um, you can look up your region and what is best to avoid. So a couple of the things that I've um, experienced personally that you tend to find sold in, in, in garden centers under shade are things like your vincas. Now these are not the um, summer annual vincas. These are the vinca major, vinca, vinca minor vine. They're sort of ground covery vines. Um, they're pretty, but yeah, they, um, they take over and out compete. Same thing with your English ivy, um, Japanese pachysandra. There's a lovely, um, Pachysandra that is native to North America, the Pachysandra procumbens. Um, that's also in your list. There's a lot of other things um, that can be used instead of that. Um, Creeping Jenny, this is one I, I found out about more recently because I thought it was lovely and then it just spread like wildflower, wildfire. And then I looked it up, and, oh, no wonder. <laughs> um, and I, I'm really trying to get away from things like Liriope um, and, and stuff like that. We've got so many lovely, neat, you know, carexes and grasses and things that are, are well behaved and found in, in North America. So um, we might as well utilize things that, that do really well. And they're already adapted to our climate. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on a couple things, show some pretty pictures. Um, put in a bad pun or two. So I, I pulled the, I pulled the staff. I said, Hey, I'm doing this talk on shade gardening. What are some of your favorite um, plants from shade and why? And so I either included them in the presentation or added them to the list um, in the resource list. But this is a list of uh, arborists or arborist Jake Hendy's favorite 12 trees for shade in the mid Atlantic they doesn't need full sun. So um, a lot of 
a lot of things that do well for us, your acers, which are your maples, um, your Fagus grandiflora, some of your cirsus, which is um, red buds, your dogwoods, your witch hazels, um, service berries, one of my favorite service berries. I actually was walking around downtown today and the service berries are in full fruit. And so I got a handful of, of, of fruit that I ate along the way. A great underutilized tree, I think. Um, your fringe trees, some of your magnolias, your magnolia virginiata, macrophylla, um, and your uh, carpinus. So some really lovely things that you can do, um, even tr in tree forms with, with some shade. Again, that, talking about that middle layer, so that can be a wide range of heights, but that's sort of what I think of as like what's more scale down to your um, size, human size level, so six feet or less. Um, cryptomeria, uh, witch hazel, hydrangeas. Um, this funky looking Dr. Seuss <laughs> flower is actually um, button bush, which can tolerate a lot of wet sites and is great for pollinators. You can see a little pollinator on there. Um, and I think this is a camellia. And then I believe this is a dracaena, this lime green, which is not hardy. Again, using those season extenders to add different interests into the, into the garden. Oak leaf hydrangea is one of my favorites. Gets this lovely burgundy color on the leaves in the fall. Um, um, Fothergilla also has a lovely fall color, a lot of different viburnums. They come in a lot of different structures. And um, Rick uh, is one of our horts, our horticulturists on staff, one of many. And um, he's really known for his, his evergreens and conifer knowledge. And so he made a list for me of his, his favorites for shade. Um, and they are all, double check, they're all, these are all evergreens. So again, this is on the list in the resources. Um, some really lovely things, the polystite, the different ferns have really great textures. Most of them don't flower or have very insignificant flowers. And then in this lower level, I love this quote from um, Joy Columbus, who's uh, director of Smithsonian Gardens. And again, I asked everyone, what's your favorite? And she said, hostas. I love how big and bright those sum and substance are and all the giant blue ones. They're just so cool. Um, and that's certainly true. We uh, having been doing some shade gardening, almost everyone is familiar with hostas. Um, they are used a lot. Uh, they do get eaten by deer regularly. So um, depending on your site, they may or may not be a good option for you, but they definitely um, come in a, a wide variety of uh, forms and colors and combinations. As you can see here, this is in the uh, Ripley garden and it really, the you know, big bold foliage plays off that tiny little epimedium or barren wart. Um, and I think there's a, a full Solomon seal behind it, but really great um, textural contrast. Again, here are just some uh, some other low growing um, plants that, you know, they doesn't have to be all green. You have some lovely spring blooming Jacob's Ladder, Tiarella down here on the bottom left, um, Solomon seal moving up, you have Nice combination of the seersucker sedge um, to Japanese painted fern, lime hookra. Let me tell you, those hookras, the coral bells, they come in just about any color imaginable, full range. I mean, if they had a pink, pink and white polka dotted one, I would not be surprised. They really come in a lot of great textures. And a lot of these things are highly adaptable to containers as well. So even if you don't have um, in-ground garden planting, a lot of these can be utilized in containers. Woodland flocks, oh man, in the springtime, it literally stops people in their tracks, either from the big swath of dark blue or the fragrance. Um, and then when people see up on the top right here, this lungwort pulmonaria, uh, named because the leaf was thought to look like a lung, um, really interesting Dr. Seuss looking plant which is 
some of the, some of the things I love. Um, and then the bottom right, it, that silvery foliage it almost looks white in the shade of the Brennera. Again, uh, lots of different colors and textures. You have lobelia, a cardinal flower, um, different ferns, lots to choose from. And then in your season extenders, your ephemerals, your annuals, and your bulbs. So I just picked these three images. Um, they all three have trees in them, different trees. And you can see the composition underneath um, of what is in those trees. So the one on the far left um, has some dutia, some sedge, some epimedium. It's got a lovely bird bath there. So, you know, some of these things you add to your shade doesn't, they don't have to all be plants. They can be ornaments and, and bird baths and even seeding. So consider that when you're doing your design. Central um, picture there is our ephemeral Virginia bluebells, one of my favorites. And then on the far right, um, you can see in the background, the yellow flowers of that Pacara aria, which is a uh, North American native. I consider it a ground cover. It, it spreads and fills in in shade and um, great for pollinators. Um, underneath the tree, which is a um, service berry. Got a lot of different geraniums, um, asters, uh, Aster de Vericatus, I believe, is in the shade, shade loving, and epimedium. And some more season extenders. Um, with some lovely color. Um, the top center image is um, annual display we did several summers ago in a part shade bed. Um, got some asparagus fern, which a lot of us think of as house plants or um, seasonal port. Like I think of them in, in a hanging basket on a porch um, in the summer from when I grew up. Um, some different angel wing begonias and different things like that. So. With that said, I hope that this has given you um, some different things to think about, that you feel empowered to go out and read your space and take notes and study it, um, that you have a good um, base mm. way to start to um, really enhance your shade garden um, experience. And so you can actually sit in a hammock and enjoy your space and not just work the whole time. Thanks, Sylvia. Do you mind un unsharing your screen? Unsharing, yes. yes. Stop share. So that we can see you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. It was it was a wonderful talk. And I, I love hearing like the nuts and bolts part you gave us at the beginning. <laughs> give us set the stage for the plants. Of course, we love the plants, but the foundation is so important. We do have right. some great questions in the chat. And oh. I want to start off with one that just came in. Um, can you recommend shade tolerant edibles? that are ornamental? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I would say the best thing to do it, I don't know where you're coming from, but um, your extension, your local extension is a great resource and they all often have um, home garden edible sections. Um, with that said, things like um, some of your herbs, especially in the middle of the summer, they can't tolerate that, that deep heat so your, your parsley your cilantro um, things like that will do well in part shade you can also do lettuce mm. my dad grows lettuce year round he just moves the container to the shade in the <laughs> summer and then moves it back out in the fall and the spring Love that. yeah or maybe put it on wheels and just roll it around <laughs> wherever the sun and the shade is um let's see the amelanchia the yeah. service berry that will take part shade your um blueberries Blueberries and cranberries, those are all um, part shade. And um, a lot of times what they consider um, cool season vegetables, sometimes you can grow those in shadier locations um, for a little bit longer. Um, you know, your okay. uh, cabbage and kale and things like that. But it, it depends on your, your temperatures. Those are great suggestions. Okay, we have another question. What about bryophytes in your shade garden or landscape? Ooh. I think that's a great idea. I'm intrigued. I don't know a whole, whole lot about bryophytes. Um, I would say that if you're really into, you know, those fern allies and mosses and stuff, absolutely. Um, I think 
they take a little bit more moisture, but um, if you, if you want to have a collection and um, absolutely encourage them, we have um, in the hopped garden, they bring out these like crazy cool tropical things that overwinter in the greenhouse. And he, he, they actually have things in hanging baskets that hang from the trees in the shade so that they can be seen and viewed at eye level and, and enjoyed more. So absolutely go for okay. it. Very cool. Okay. We have another question about from someone who lives in the urban environment. And so doesn't have a lot of room for that structure layer you're talking about mm -hmm. trees or whatnot. Uh, I know you mentioned pergolas or other, you know, structures what else can you maybe offer as a suggestion well one of my other talks was um, gardening in small spaces making the most of small spaces and I do uh, which is recorded and available um, for folks to look at um, my suggestion having lived in a one-bedroom apartment in an urban setting for nine years I'm very aware of that it the caveat is what is the building rule HOA? That's usually <laughs> what is the trickiest thing. For that bigger layer, you can put some trees that are either slow growing or smaller trees in a container and train them to grow in an arching habit. You can um, train vines to grow up like a trellis. You might not be able to attach it to a wall, but there are um, trellises that come with um, like flower boxes on the base. You can also train them to grow around the railing. Um, yeah, I've, I feel like I've, I've done the like crazy thing where you have the, the wires going everywhere and things growing. Around. So there, there are a number of, of shade loving um, vines that um, are, don't get out of control too quickly, but containers, containers are the way to go. Okay, thanks for that. I, I knew you'd have a great suggestion. <laughs> Having seen your talk, your other talk. Um, now, this is a this is kind of a thought provoking question, especially for your talk, just talking us through all these different combinations of mm -hmm. textures. This um, this person would like to know now how many hostas are too many hostas? Do you have a Do you have an opinion on that? I do not, because gardens, especially personal home gardens are as different as every everybody. If all you want is hostas and they make you happy, by all means have hostas that make you happy. Um, I wouldn't be happy with just hostas, but you can certainly incorporate them with a lot of other things. So if you wanna have a hosta collection, have a hosta collection, they're great. They're also great in, in um, flower arranging. Right. Okay, here's another good question from the chat. Um, can you recommend some shade loving vines? Mm, yes, so there's a list on um, on the plant list. So I'll try to remember them off the top of my head. Um, any of your Dutchman's pipes, Aristolochia, um, those are really lovely. There are some that are North American natives and then there are some tropical ones that you'd have to bring in over winter. Um, Janet Draper is one of our horticulturists and she always brings out these enormous Aristolochia, I think they're gigantia, they're <laughs> literally as big as your face, and strings them up across, um, across the garden. It's lovely. Um, yeah, there's, um, I'm trying to think some others off the top of my head. Oh, the climbing hydrangea and the false climbing hydrangea, schizo schizophragma, are also some great ones. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and this is kind of a complicated one. Okay. Okay. Go. Will will my soil be the same in all areas of my third of an acre or my three quarter of an acre lot? So that's a good question. Right. So probably not. That would be my guess. Um, with soil testing, if you're going to plant up the entire the entire spot, I would encourage doing multiple soil test multiple locations so let's say um you're going wherever you're going to be digging pick that sort of area and if you're noticing different um, soil when you dig in or it feels different or it drains differently um, then have a separate sample for those areas um, because what you, you might find that you have um, especially if it's lower grade a lot of silt and uh, organic matter may have um, just by gravity gone to those lower grades and it might be more 
rich and, and better draining than maybe higher up in your yard or, or something like that. But I would, I would encourage um, you to do multiple locations if you think that they might be totally different. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, a recording of our webinar and the plant list will be available on our website within the next few weeks. And if you're interested in learning more about our program, our weekly program, Let's Talk Gardens, our website has over 30 recordings available for viewing, especially more presentations from our lovely Sylvia. And I wanna thank you, <laughs> Sylvia, for your presentation. And I wanna thank Sarah, who's our co-host for today's event. And I want to mention next week, please join us for our program, Cicadas, Cicadas! with Dr. Cicadas with Dr. <laughs> Holly Walker. She'll be joining us. And I'm also pleased to announce that the Smithsonian will be reopening all of our museums by the end of the summer. So please check smithsonian.org or our edu website for more information. And again, we look forward to seeing you in the gardens. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Thank you all.